All right. Well, for those of you who are catching up with us on the recording next time, my name is Scott McCormick, and we're gathered for the Articulate Friday afternoon Bible study, and we're studying the Gospel of John right now. We're still in John chapter 3, if I get my Bible over there. And um, this is going to finish up for us the, the final paragraph of Jesus's conversation with a man named Nicodemus. Uh, we've been studying this conversation for weeks now. Should I spell Nicodemus right? And we're going to wrap it up here with some of the most famous verses of Scripture in the Bible. There are many um, non-Christians, non-believers, never picked up a Bible, but they know John 3.16. They, they've heard it. They know what it says. But so often, we don't really know what it means. So we're going to take it in context here. This isn't a one-off verse um, to be spouted off. This is, this is in the middle of a conversation between two men about a particular subject. And that's how we're going to read it in context. So before we dive in on the verses we're going to study today, I'd like for us to do what we've been doing for the last few weeks and reread this whole conversation so that we've got it out in the open. And then we'll dive into this portion uh, that we'll wrap up today. So let's see, in order on my screen, Katie, you're first. If you'll please read for us John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Matt, you're next. Can you read 9 through 15? And then Alyssa, if you'll read for us the portion we're going to be focusing on today, that's 16 through 21. And then there are many other passages we're going to cover today. I'll start. You must be born again. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. <clears throat> but, who, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly and that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Very good. So here we've got Jesus speaking with Nicodemus, and I'm going to start by us rolling back a couple of verses. Jesus has been explaining to him what he called earthly things, these concepts such as regeneration. Who remembers what this big theological word regeneration means? Born again. Being born again. Very good. Regeneration is the new birth. This is taking that heart of stone and transforming it to a heart of flesh, bringing life into 
a soul that the Bible says is dead in sin and trespasses. So he's talked about regeneration. He's talked about the spirit being the operator, the worker who does this work of regeneration and compares it to the wind using a, a play on words. Those same word is used in the Greek for both wind and spirit. That word is pneuma in the Greek, pneuma. The P is silent. Um, and, and so he's been talking about these earthly things, and then he begins to talk about some heavenly things. He, he says, you know, how, if you don't believe me when I teach you these earthly things, how will I explain to you heavenly things? And then he gives a little, well, here's how you can know I have the authority to talk about heavenly things. I'm the only man on this earth who's ever actually been in heaven. That's where I came from. And he then refers to himself with this epithet, the son of man. That's his favorite phrase to refer to himself. And we, we had a little discussion before the recording about what does that son of man actually mean? And part of it is, yes, he is the second Adam. He is, he is descended from Adam. He is a, um, the second Adam and that his father is God. He does not have an earthly father in that respect. And he is performing the, the requirements of the covenant of works that Adam failed to do. And so in that respect, the Son of Man is talking about his humanity. But I want us to also go back and look at a reference in the Old Testament that points to this exact phrase and relates it to Jesus. And that's, that's what he's taking on when he, when he uses this phrase in this place. So keep a finger in John chapter 3 and flip with me to Daniel 7. Daniel is one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Who remembers why we call them major or minor? What's the difference? How much they wrote. It's all about how much they wrote. It doesn't mean that Daniel was less important. It just means that he wasn't, he didn't write as much as somebody like a Jeremiah or an Isaiah. So in Daniel chapter 7, one of the things to know about Daniel here is this is during the exile of the Israelites in Babylon. Daniel came to uh, a position of great power there. The Lord blessed him and gave him favor with the king. One of the ways that that happened was by Daniel's ability to interpret dreams and visions. The context here in Daniel chapter 7 is that Daniel himself was given a vision, given a dream in the night. And the first part of there talks about some uh, things related to eschatology, the end times. We're not going to go into the details on those. We're going to skip down to verse 9. And so let's start in verse 9. And Lauren, I think it's your turn to read next. If you'll please read for us verses 9 and 10 of Daniel chapter 7. Yes. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A steam of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. Very good. So here Daniel is given a an, an image, a vision of the throne room of God. And I'm going to draw a really nice stick figure of the throne here. There it is. There's the throne of God, right? And who is seated on this throne? What is the name that's given there? Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days. This is a, refer, a, a reference to God the Father. This is the Almighty. This is the creator of heaven and earth and of the entire universe, the Ancient of Days. And his hair was like pure wool. That's sort of hard to draw stick figure-wise. And his throne was fiery flame. So here's the fire. This is going to become the messiest picture ever. And it had wheels on it. All right, that's cool. And those were on fire. And out of in front of it was a stream of fire, like a river of fire. Everything is on fire. That's how burnishing, bright, and powerful it is. And he is surrounded by a court of a million servants. That's what, for those of you who need the multiplication now, a thousand times a thousand, that's a million servants. And a hundred million who just stood in attendance to watch him and to listen to him. 
that's the setting here. And then it says the books were opened. Whenever we see books were opened like this, this is usually a phrase of judgment. These are books that in which deeds are recorded and we're about to begin pronouncing judgment. So let's get down to verse 13. And Lauren, you didn't get to read enough. So please read 13 and 14 now as the scene continues. Sure. I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Very good. So who is this son of man in this passage? Knowing what we know from the New Testament, because remember, Daniel's in the Old Testament. Jesus has not actually been born as a human yet. They would not have been aware of that. But looking back of what we know from the New Testament, who is this referring to? Jesus. It's referring to Jesus. And the image here is a son of man. But here he's coming and he's being presented before God the Father. And to him is given a kingdom, a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. And so we see here not just someone who has a component of humanity, not just someone who is presented in this context as having deity, but as someone who has authority and sovereignty. He is now King of Kings and Lord of Lords in this context. And when Jesus refers back to this from the portions of the New Testament where he's using this name. He is claiming this idea of the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7 for himself. Now, some people will say, well, you know, but Jesus never said, I'm the King of the Jews. He never said, well, I'm the King of Kings. Why do we call him that? Well, this is why we call him that. He actually made this claim referring to his own sovereignty and authority over all nations of the earth. And so when he uses this phrase, flip now with me back to John chapter 3. He uses this phrase, and he uses, he, he, he says something really strange. He says, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now, this was in comparison to uh, another reference from the Old Testament, where Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And we drew some parallels last week between those two. But this context of being lifted up, this is on the cross. So now this is someone who has authority over all things. He is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. All peoples, nations, and tongues will bow down before him and serve him. And yet, here he is being placed on a cross as a sacrifice. So... Let's continue now that we've got that context. Let's continue now in verse 13. We've made it to the all most favorite verse of all time, most quoted verse. John chapter 3, verse 16. And I'll reread that again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So that starts off with this word for. And we every single word in the Bible is critical here. This looks like a transition word. This is one of those words we might just skip over. But when he says for here, he's saying that everything that I've been explaining to you up until this point has been so I can make this conclusion. This is built on the things that we've been discussing. He says, for God so loved the world. Now, who is doing the loving here? Because that's important. It's God. When we say God, this is God the Almighty. This is this is the creator of all things you and I would not even exist if it were not for God having created us. He is ultimately pure. He is ultimately holy. And when God loves, it's not a little kind of love. It's not like I say, well, I love caramel. Okay. I do love caramel. I really like it, but that's not the kind of love we're talking about here. We're talking about someone who is love and he's doing the loving. It says for God so loved the world. Now, a lot of times people will read this sentence and they'll insert this word here, 
well, they'll stick it after love. For God so loved, uh, it goes, it's better at the front, so much loved the world, okay? In other words, we say so, and we say, well, man, I love the world so much. Well, he's God. If he loves, it's a lot of love. There, there's, not a, there's not a reason to take that to the superlative. It doesn't mean he loved the world so much. It means the manner in which he loved the world. The manner in which he loved the world. That, in other words, sending the son was an expression of his love. He loved the world, and therefore he sent his son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, this word world here, this word world is going to come up again in the next few verses. In the Greek, it's cosmos. Now, the word world in the New Testament in Greek is always this word cosmos, and it's used in a lot of different contexts. Sometimes it means all of the created things that ever existed, the plants, the trees, the planets, the stars, all of the created universe. Sometimes the word world means all of the people in the world without exception. Sometimes the world, world by context in the New Testament means only that sinful uh, portion of the world that rejects God. It's the, the, the nations of the world that stiff arm God and say, we don't want to have anything to do with you. Sometimes that's what the world means in the New Testament. Sometimes it means some of all people on the world. Uh, in other words, there's people of a certain type, but without exception, all around the world. That's, that's more of what it means here. God so loved the world for a given purpose. And we see some qualifications in this sentence that Jesus uses. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that, right there it says, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's not, it's not much of a love to say, I've given something that doesn't actually apply to you. We know that only those who believe on the name of Christ can participate in this concept of eternal life, that, are, that they're the only ones who are made right with God. So in a way, this love that God has that is so ultimate and special and the very pinnacle expression of love is specifically directed in this sentence to those who believe. All who would ever believe on the name of Christ, all from the Old Testament looking forward to the Messiah, believing on him, all from the New Testament, that's us looking back to the cross, all the sins of those who would believe on his name were placed on Christ when it says God gave his only son. So as we continue, um, it says that he, the, he gave his only son. This word gave here. This is not the same thing as saying sent. We see the word sent in the next verse. It says, for God did not send his son into the world. When it says gave, there's not just a sending into the world, there's a lot more going on than that. This is a reference back to the previous verse where it says the Son of Man would be lifted up. When we talk about gave, we mean he was given up to the sacrifice of the cross. When God gave his son, he gave him as a sacrifice. He was put on the cross. He was then rejected by God in a sense. God turned his face away from him because all of the sins of uh, all those who would believe on him were placed on him, and he was sacrificed in the likeness of sinful flesh. This is, a, this is a giving over, a giving up, not just a sending to. You know, if, if I sent my son to you, that doesn't mean that I killed him for you. But here, if I gave him up for you, if I sacrificed my son for you, that's a completely different picture. And that's what it's talking about right here in this sentence. Now, the end results of this giving up are twofold. Let's reread it again. That he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. That's the first one. Let me get my marker back out. Should not perish. And the second one is 
but have eternal life. Now, those who do not believe, those who are still in their sins, those who have rejected Christ, who have not believed on his name yet, the ultimate punishment for that, that the, the, the consequence of that unbelief is perishing. And so in order to not perish in that context, if that's the punishment, then you need to be reconciled to the one that you have offended. The offended party is God. And being reconciled to him, we have a word for that. It's justification. Justification. In other words, the sacrifice that Jesus made paid the penalty that you would have paid. You would have perished. Jesus perished in your place. Therefore, you are justified before God. You are, you are counted as though you had not sinned. On top of that, there's this have eternal life. This is not just, you're, you're, you're not just not punished. Instead, you're actually rewarded. So this, this promise of eternal life is based on righteousness. Those who are righteousness would attain eternal life. In order for us to be counted as righteous, in order for us to be righteous, then we need to be what's called sanctified. I apologize for my scribble scrabble. Let me try to write that a little better. Sanctified. Sanctification is the act of making something holy. In our case, there are, there are three parts in this phase of sanctification. I'm going to draw a timeline because I love timelines. So in eternity past, I'm going to draw an infinity, minus infinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit purposed to redeem a people for themselves, for the Father to give as a love gift to the Son. God intended to send the Son to do this redeeming. The Son, in the fullness of time, I'm going to draw a cross here on our timeline, came and died on the cross and was raised again, accomplishing that salvation. Then, here's me. I was born. This is, this is when Scott was born. And at age 13... I heard the gospel for the first time and was reborn. That was the, the, the occasion the Holy Spirit used to open my mind to the, understand the things of God. And hearing the gospel, I gladly accepted. Well, at this point, this is where we say I was justified. It's, it's a moment in time kind of thing. And sometimes you'll hear people say, well, that's when I was saved. Well, saved is this big spectrum here because God intended to save in eternity and Ultimately, that salvation is consummated uh, either at Jesus' return or um, when I die. At that point, I'll be glorified. Glorified. There's an extra R. There you go. Y'all can kind of read that. So I was justified at my conversion when I accepted the gospel. When I die and then go to heaven, or if Jesus returns before then, all of the sin in my life will be completely removed. I'll be transformed into a totally holy being, that's called being glorified in between those two states. From age 13 until that happens, this is a part of my life, of, of any believer's life, that we call progressive sanctification. This is a daily being conformed into the likeness of Christ kind of situation. The Holy Spirit is helping me to understand Scripture so that I can know it better, so that it can change who I am and how I understand what sin is in my life and the good works that I should be doing instead. And so I'm not a perfected person yet. That happens when I'm glorified. But I'm daily moving in that direction. Well, here, this idea of eternal life, I'm already on this train at this point, okay? Once, once I've put my faith and trust in Christ and I'm justified, the Bible says that all who have been justified will be glorified. So ultimately, this extends into positive infinity. This process of sanctification grants all who believe on his name eternal life. All of these things are wrapped up in this one verse. So I want to pause for a second before we move on. So we've got a lot more to cover. Um, do you all have questions or, or, or comments on that? Yeah, I do. Um, I think this is such a cool concept and I've studied this as well 
Um, so justification comes by your confession that you believe in Jesus Christ and you are granted eternal or eternity with God. But glorification can, 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 can come in two different ways. Once when we die and we are glorified, or it's an ongoing process. So we die to ourselves every day, or we could be dying to ourselves every day. That, that's a, there's a price to pay for sanctification. There's a death process, and it doesn't only have to mean your body is dying. There's a death process to... If you have an anger issue, there's a death process. If you have a pride issue, there's a death process where you are dying to self in order to be glorified through Jesus. And so I think sanctification, beyond justification, beyond being born again, beyond saying, I believe in Christ, that's our journey in life as a Christian. There's, it's that continual process of changing and, and, and moving towards God and becoming mm -hmm. more like him. But in order to do that, we have to die to self. Mm -hmm. And Jesus died to self, you know, physically. Um, but, you know, it's just that repeated process um, until we actually physically really die. Yep. It's yep. really cool, this, this whole process of sanctification. Yeah, so, and one thing you said reminded me, um, when we say this word justified here, we can think of this as being positional, sanctification. In other words, before I was justified, I was at odds with God. I right. was against him. I was under his wrath. After being justified, now I'm in his good graces. I've been restored and reconciled. So positionally, I've been sanctified in that respect. I'm still, however, a sinner. There is still sin dwelling in me, which means over my life, as the Holy Spirit works in my life, I go from a positional sanctification to a process of progressive sanctification, and then either at my death or when Jesus returns, the, when we say glorified, we're referring to permanent sanctification. That's, not, that's why it's, it's, it's a journey. Nobody ever arrives and they're, you know, perfect, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's oh, a yeah. Journey. I mean, we, we can remember the day that we gave our life to the Lord or will give our life to the Lord if that's not happened yet, but, and that's justification, but the rest of your life should be a, a process of sanctification. It's moving closer and closer and closer to the image of God, being mm -hmm. transforming into him, and that's death to self. So that, that's a journey, you know, that we should be on for the rest of our lives. Any other thoughts before we move on? I just want to comment. I think it's also, uh, it, it, can, it can be both assurance and warning, depending on where you're at, because that process of sanctification shows fruit like you're going to see as this process goes on the spirit is going to show you sin and i, I mean I, I know in my life anyway and i talk to people who are older than me uh it it can feel like you're getting worse and worse over time because you see more and more of the sin that you weren't even aware of before uh, mm -hmm. as god reveals it to you um but that's also assurance that that god that you are justified that that God is working in you because people who are not don't have this work happening. Um, and if you're not seeing that process of repentance, um, then that should be, you know, kind of a flag, a little warning bell. Um, you know, we all go through ups and downs, but at a time in life when you feel stagnant or whatever, um, one of the, one of the things that, um, it, it sounds so funny to say out loud because it seems so obvious, but, Sometimes you don't have any desire to read the Bible. You don't have any desire to pray. And my pastor has pointed out before, you can pray for the desire to pray. <laughs> you can pray for the desire to be in the Word. Um, and so, you know, when you're not seeing that fruit in your life as, as time goes on, that's, that's okay to pray for. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Very good. Well, let's continue. So we're moving on. So that's verse 16, but it's not there by itself. Jesus now continues to sort of um, expound this concept because he's blowing Nicodemus's mind with what Nicodemus understood the Messiah's job to be. And now he's saying, but this is what my role is actually to be. So he sent his son, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then Jesus continues to explain for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved 
through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So in the ESV here, it says this word condemn. You'll see some other translations use the word judge. Um, I think this is, this is fine to have either one. The point here is that uh, if you're condemned, you have been judged and found wanting. And, and that's the context of using the word judged, if you use that word there. That those who believed are, are, are judged and not found wanting. Those who are, uh, do not believe are condemned. Now, he uses some words here that are sort of messing with Nicodemus's head. One of the things that we need to know about the, the, the Pharisaical, the, um, the Jewish understanding of what the Messiah's role was to be at the time. We talked a little bit about how they expected a temporal Messiah, someone who would come in time, but it would just be a man who was really great and would do good things for God and for the nation of Israel. They expected him to be a uh, political Messiah, someone who would come and actually become king and raise the Jews up to a nation of power and prominence again and push out the Roman invaders and the Gentiles who had uh, conquered their land. But they also thought of him as a punisher, that he would come and punish those who were not Jews. But where did they get this idea? They got it from the Old Testament. So let's read a couple of these references from the Old Testament. The first is in the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 4. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Chapter 4 is the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament. And um, let's see, Katie, I'm on page 802. We have the same Bible, so you can just skip right to it. So we've already seen some of Malachi chapter 4 before. Um, this is the same chapter where it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And that pointed to John the Baptist. We studied him a few weeks ago. And um, it says that he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. That's that prophecy. But we're going to read instead the first three verses of Malachi chapter 4. And Claudia, um, if you'll please read for us those three verses. You want four four, two through five. I'm sorry. Um, uh, no, uh, Malachi chapter four, verses one through three. This is talking about that great and terrible day of the Lord. This is a messianic prophecy. Let's okay. read that part. Sure. Um, for behold, the day is coming burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all the evil doers will be sub stubble. The day is coming. Wait a minute. Sorry. The day is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them with neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Very good. So here, this is a reference to um, Christ's coming as the Messiah, but it uses these phrases like, those who fear my name, those who fear my name would be rescued by the Son of Righteousness, and then it also refers to those who are evildoers, and, and here it's saying that the Messiah would come to rescue and save those who fear my name, but to punish those who are evildoers. Well, the Jews took this to mean, fear my name, well, those who fear my name, well, those must be Jews. And those who don't, well, those must be Gentiles. And so they took this concept of believers, of, of those who were actually pious and, and worshipped the God, uh, the, the one true God in truth. And they said, well, then that actually, instead of being a thing about you, your belief, they said that well, really, that was just the Jewish nation. It's a little bitty twist. It's not a big twist. It's a little bitty twist. And then this idea of evildoers, those who don't worship the one true God, well, therefore, that must mean all the Gentile nations. And so the Messiah was going to come, and one of the things he was going to do was condemn the world, the world in that context referring to the Gentile world. All right? 
we could read more about this in Psalm 2. It's a longer passage, so I'm just going to let you guys read that after class. Um, but it refers back to this exact same concept that Jesus would come as a judge to judge the nations of the earth. But here Jesus says, back in John chapter 3, verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Well, is that a contradiction of Malachi and Psalm 2? It's not. Jesus came in his first advent, in, in his first coming, when he was born. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Here, Nicodemus is talking to him at his first advent. He came first to save, but he will come back to judge. And we can see that, and I, I want us to flip forward to the book of Revelation. Keep a finger in John and go to the book of Revelation, chapter 19. Revelation, who, who knows who wrote the book of Revelation? John. John did. And the word revelation is our English translation of the Greek word apocalypse. So anytime you hear somebody say the word apocalypse, it doesn't mean end of the world. It means revelation. So that's just a little pro tip. Um, if you watch movies and that comes up, you should be like, hey, guys, read your Bible. Okay, it's not what apocalypse means. All right, so we're in Revelation 19, and I'd like to read for us verses 11 through 16. This is a picture of Jesus' second coming, returning to judge the nations of the world. In verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written, that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. That should sound familiar from John chapter 1. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So in his first coming, he came to save. He did not come to condemn. Now, it also says back in John chapter 3 that all those who do not believe on his name are condemned already. The judgment is made. They've made their choice not to follow Christ. And so at the end of the age, when he returns, he will come as judge to strike down the nations of the earth and tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. By the way, that's where that book title came from, The, the Grapes of Wrath. It came from that verse right there. It has nothing to do with the Bible. So please don't go read that book <laughs> and think that Mr. Scott told you to go read that. I did not. Mr. Scott. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's what he's talking about here. Um, and this is a challenge that I want to have for you. If we flip back to John chapter 3, um, whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. If, if that's you, that means that currently you are still under the wrath of God. You are in a precarious position. You are not in a stable state because you are not reconciled to God. We're not guaranteed the next breath or even tomorrow. Uh, we had a couple tornadoes come through here in town last week, one of which touched down uh, less than a mile from my house and knocked over a tree which fell through a roof and killed a man in his sleep. I mean, instant. That's how it happened. He went to bed thinking he was safe and he never woke up. So that's the same for all of us. And if that's you, challenge yourself today. Look inside yourself. Have you chosen Christ? That's what this whole gospel is about. Look to Christ to be saved, and then you will no longer be under the wrath of God. So I'll continue. Let's read in verse 19. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does thing, uh, wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. 
but whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now, there's some, there's some words being used here that John loves to use and that we've seen before already in John chapter 1. There is this concept of light. And in John chapter 1, this referred to um, a divine understanding of the truth. But it also refers to, ultimately, Christ. So if we will flip back, and I guess we're back to you, Katie. Um, if you will read for us just one page back there in your Bible, John chapter 1, there's a short passage there about the light that is a direct parallel to what Jesus is saying here to Nicodemus. Please reread for us John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Very good. So in that passage, he's talking about himself. I'm sorry, John the Evangelist is talking about Jesus as the true light who's come into the world. And that in general, the people of the world have rejected him. That's explained further in this passage in John chapter 3. The reason for that is because their works for evil. Coming to Christ exposes those works. One of the things that is required in turning to Christ, turning to Christ requires turning away from something else, turning away from sin. The word for that is repentance. Repentance. To repent of something is to turn back from it, to forsake it, to go in another direction. This is not like what my daughter likes to do when she immediately realizes that we've caught her doing something she's not supposed to do, the first words out of her mouth are, I'm sorry. Well, it's not actually an expression of sorrow. She's not actually sorry. She's just trying to get out of being punished. That's not repentance. Repentance is, yes, I am sorry. I'm actually sorry, not because I don't want to be punished, but because I realize and understand that what I did was wrong, and I'm going to stop doing it and instead doing that which is good. That which is good in this context here is turning to Christ, coming to the light and allowing his light, coming to Christ and allowing his light to expose the sin in our hearts so that we can repent of it. Um, this, there's, I read one commentator that pointed out the, the interesting, uh, contradiction is the wrong word, but there's, there's almost, um, there's a parallel here that those who come to the light, those who come to the light are not judged. It says they're not condemned, they're not judged. But the reason for that is that they've already judged themselves. In other words, they looked in their heart and said, I'm a sinner and I recognize it. And that means I gotta do something different. So I'm gonna turn to Christ and rely on his righteousness. Those who remain in the dark are judged, they are condemned, and the reason for that is because they have not judged themselves as being unworthy. They looked inside themselves and says, well, I'm basically good. I don't need God. I don't want his influence in my life. I don't want his authority over my life, so I'm going to reject him. And so there's this interesting opposite there. Those who turn to Christ are those who look inside and say, I'm a sinner and recognize it and repent of that. Those who remain outside of Christ are those who either refuse to look inside themselves or they look inside and refuse to acknowledge their sinfulness. So that's another part of that too. And so that, that wraps up verse 21. We've, 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 I think we've beat this conversation to death now because we've spent a good four weeks in it, but it's been, a good, I think, a good time to dwell in the minute details of the doctrine that Jesus is laying on thick for Nicodemus. This is the, the, not the last time we'll see Nicodemus, but we're not going to see him pick back up again uh, for several chapters in the Gospel of John. The next time we'll see Nicodemus show up again 
is when he comes to the defense of Jesus and the Sanhedrin, when the, the rulers of the Jews try to go and arrest him, they send soldiers to arrest him. The soldiers come back empty handed because they say, we've never heard anybody speak like this before. And they, so they, they denounce the, the soldiers and then Nicodemus sort of raises his hand and says, well, shouldn't we give the man a fair trial before we say he's a bad guy? And then they turn on him. And then we don't see Nicodemus again until after Jesus has died. He comes and brings 75 pounds of spices to prepare Jesus's body for burial. That is a lot of money, by the way. 75 pounds of spices, and then actually helps prepare his body for burial. This is somebody not in his own family. In doing so, Nicodemus made himself ceremonially unclean which is something that no ruler of the Jews would have done except for extreme circumstances. And he chooses to do this to honor the Lord that he now fully loves and trusts and follows. So this conversation, we haven't seen Nicodemus talk since verse 9. He sort of sat in submissive willingness to learn at this point. And that desire to learn, we're going to see in the background, just continue to develop. And that's how we'll finish up. Questions, thoughts? Well, we're right up here at, at the end of time. So instead I'll make an announcement. I said in the channel that we wouldn't have class until the eighth, but that's because I can't do math. Um, I intended to take a two week break, which means not the first nor the eighth, but the week after that, which I guess is the 15th, will be the next time that, that we have a lesson. That doesn't mean that we can't get together and hang out and talk about the Bible, but I'm not going to study and prep a lesson. Um, and I'm also taking a break from the men's class as well. So this is just going to be some time for me to, to read some other things and um, take a break from it. But we'll get back together. I'm good. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for um, hanging in there. It's been really a good, we like kind of really tore apart this, this chapter here and this first part of John. It's been really good. Mm -hmm. They say that John is the foundational book of the Bible where you, 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 do, you know, direct new believers to because it's a book of love and it has so much stuff. And we, I think sometimes we underestimate what's in there, you know? Right. Right. Yeah, no, I've heard people, new believers pointed to the Gospel of John to read that as sort of a, a beginnings kind of thing. And it's written in a way, you know, the language is not terribly complex. So it's, it's accessible in that way. And it has a very high Christology. In other words, it, it elevates Christ. It, it lifts him up in worship. But it's also very deep that like theologians can get lost in the concepts in it too. So there's sort of that dichotomy there. But yeah, that's that's why I really like John. That's why I'm glad you guys are coming on this journey with me. I'm having fun. I'm having fun, and I'm excited to get back to it when we do get back to it. So the next, you're saying the next two weeks, right? Next two Fridays, I'll take off. So we'll be back the 15th, and I'll correct that statement in the channel. Because okay. um, I think I miscounted for the men's class, too, at church. So I'm going to go correct that. Um, okay. Yep. Thank you, Scott. But in the meantime, do not stop studying in the Word. Keep reading your Bibles, even if it's just a little bit every single day. That adds up, and it's time well spent uh, with the Lord. So please continue to do that. And if it would help you, if you want to say, hey, what should I be studying? I can, I can point you to things to study. That's cool, too. You can do that, too. Um, I was going to mention, if we wanted to connect, even for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, for the next two Fridays and just each say a quick thing about what we're studying. I'd be super happy to do that too. Uh -huh. I can do that. Yeah. I'm um, asking for God, God for direction a lot right now. So I have myself in the book of Proverbs every morning. It's a great, great book just for wisdom and direction. And it's every time I read the book of Proverbs, I sit there and say, I, I went through this in life. Like, why didn't I turn? To, why didn't I see this? Like, why didn't I read this earlier? And like, this is this is so good. It's like taking a little a mini note of what to do. I guess the more you read, the more you absorb. But it's a great book. 
little clips and bits. So. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'll let y'all get back to it. Um, can somebody please volunteer to pray to close us out and then we'll get back to work. Hi, Will. Thanks, Matt. Let's pray. Our Lord God in heaven, we thank you again for this time and we thank you for blessing us with your word. We thank you that you, uh, by your spirit, can give us so much comfort through it. And we thank you that you have made so many good promises to your people throughout history and not one word of them has fallen to the ground. You have kept them all. And we thank you for the confidence that gives us in the promises that you make to us that that we still look forward to the fulfillment of, of uh, glorification and eternity with you. And we ask you to uh, encourage us and give us hope on this journey that we would never lose heart. We ask you to uh, grant us strength even through times of trial. We ask for comfort in difficult times uh, and the challenges we face right now in unusual times. And we pray you will uh, continue to give us uh, certainty and assurance in your sovereign will and uh, in the knowledge that that nothing happens outside of your control and we ask you to uh, grant us diligence each day in our work in our play and in studying your word and we pray that in all these things you would help us to glorify your name and not ours and we pray all of this in jesus name amen amen, amen. thanks for coming See you later. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. Have a good break, Scott. Thanks. Yeah.